to this presentation of Goodhart's Restaurant, which has led me to the origins of Herman Wolk's Don't Stop the Carnival. Don't Stop the Carnival, as you know, was written by Herman Wolk, uh, published in 1965, and supposedly is based upon stories from the Royal Mail Inn, which was located on Hassel Island. There are accounts that suggest that Wolk operated, owned, and even managed the Royal Mail Inn. Tonight, we will examine the premise based upon the interviews I have conducted with the people who knew and remember Herman Wolk and researching the historical records and the documentation of events. Before I proceed, I must advise the audience that the Zoom presentation is being recorded and that I will be at times quoting passages from the novel whose language may seem a bit harsh. A little bit about Herman Wolk. Herman Wolk was born on 27 May, 1915 in the Bronx, New York. He died 22 May, 2019 in Palm Springs, California at the age of 103, five days shy of his 104th birthday. He authored The Cane Mutiny in 1951 for which he received the Pulitzer Prize in 1952. He authored Marjorie Morningstar, The Winds of War, War and Remembrance, which he started to write while he was here on St. Thomas and many other novels. The one we'll discuss tonight is Don't Stop the Carnival, which was published in 1965. Herman Woke first came to St. Thomas in 1947. He stayed at a guest house on Crystal Gata called Smith's Fancy. The owners of Smith's Fancy were Ira and Dara Smith, transplanted New Yorker. Ira had been a successful window display company owner that did window displays for the major department stores on Fifth Avenue, New York. Ira employed over 200 people and just one day decided to up and sell his company and move to St. Thomas and open a guest house called Smith's Fancy. This is where Herman Woke met Ira Smith. Ira Smith is considered to be the inspiration upon which the main character, Norman Paperman of Don't Stop the Carnival is depicted. The Smith's Fancy operated from 1947 to 1962. Woke returned to St. Thomas and resided of here from 1958 to 1964. He first rented a house on Government Hill and then purchased a home on Skyline Drive, which is still there today, but it is currently damaged due to the hurricanes. That is current, that's the second floor. You can see the swimming pool and uh, how it overlooks Hassel Island. And that's another view from his, um, his patio. For those that are not familiar with the storyline of Don't Stop the Carnival, I will do a short recap. After suffering a heart attack, a middle-aged Broadway publicity, publicity agent named poor Norman Paperman flees the high-stress urban life of New York for what he believes to be the quiet, soothing Caribbean. With his millionaire tycoon friend, Lester Atlas, Paperman flies to the fictional island of Kinja, King George Island, which is, quote, once owned by the British, before that it was Danish before that French, and before that cannibal, where the smoking gun battles between the sailing ships and the old stone forts went with the flag changes, then to the Americans during a deal during World War II, unquote. Paperman comes to investigate the resort that is for sale on the island, which is now renamed Amerigo. Paperman acquires the resort hotel called the Gulf Reef Club, in hopes that he will provide a nice, peaceful life for the Harry Press agent and his wife, Henny. What happens next is a comedy of errors and terrors, as practically everything Paperman touches turns to trouble. Paperman nearly drowns while scuba diving, but is pulled ashore by a Navy frogman named Bob Cohen. Within just a few days of the purchase of the Gulf Reef Club, Paperman learns that the guests are threatening to leave because of electrical problems, a water shortage, 
a water pump issue, which is about to shut down the entire plumbing system. As he sets about the business of fixing up the club, which was required by the purchase agreement from the bank, Paperman realizes that competent tradesmen are as, quote, scarce as snowflakes on the island, and that, quote, practically every day is a holiday, unquote. As this remodeling project gets started, the club manager takes offense to something that Paperman said or didn't say or did and didn't do and quits. As Paperman desperately tries to find a replacement manager, the water reserves run out and Paperman must purchase several truckloads of water from a barge to refill the cistern. With the cistern partially filled with a few days supply of water, a stiff earthquake rolls through the islands, shattering the cistern, losing precious gallons of drinking water. When the local workmen hire to repair a hole in the clubhouse walk off the job, the club employees recommend a local man, a machete-wielding, calypso-speaking Frenchman named Hippolyte Lamartine. The club employees consider him, quote, phony, because he was sent to a mental institution for an altercation he had with a policeman involving a machete. After many more misadventures, Norman Paperman finally realizes that the Caribbean is probably not the place for an expatriate New Yorker. He arranges to sell the Gulf Reef Club and then, and but before the deal goes through, he is ready to leave and go back to New York. And this is to me, one of the quintessential quotes of the novel. Quote, the West Indian is not exactly hostile to change, but he is not much inclined to believe in it. This comes from a, a piece of wisdom that his climate of eternal summer teaches him. It is that under the parade of human effort and noise, today is like yesterday and tomorrow will be like today. That existence is a wheel of recurring patterns from which no one escapes. That all anybody does in this life is live for a while and then dies for good without finding out much. And that therefore the idea is to take things easy and enjoy the passing of time under the sun. The white people charging hopefully around the islands these days in the noon glare, making deals, bulldozing airstrips, hammering up hotels, laying out marinas, opening up new banks, nightclubs, and gift shops are to him merely a passing plague. They have come before and gone before. What I think Wolf was saying was the West Indian had figured out what life is really all about. So without further ado, Let's take a real life, let's take a look at the real life stories that possibly influenced the novel's storyline and location. The first place we want to take a look at is a restaurant on Hassel Island called Good Hearts on Hassel Island. And if you notice, this was an advertisement in the Virgin Islands Daily News, dated 3 March 1959. This was told to me in an interview, several interviews I had with Miss Nancy Goodhart Matthews and her older brother, Harry Goodhart, who are the surviving children of Harry and Janine Goodhart. Goodhart's at Hassel Island Restaurant on Hassel Island operated from 1956 to 1964. Harry and Janine Goodhart, originally from Denver, Colorado, along with their two children, Harry, age 12, and Nancy, age five at the time, were on an extended family adventure throughout Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean when they fell in love with St. Thomas. There was a property for sale on Hassel Island owned by an eccentric, Miss Charlotte McFadden Johnson, who was said to have once danced with Isadora Duncan in her prime. The eccentric Johnson was said to have owned two lions on the property as evidenced by Nancy as to the claw and shoe marks on the furniture, which was left behind. The property was originally constructed by Henry Bissell of vacuum cleaner fame and boasted the first hot water, solar hot water system on the island, consisting of copper pipes painted black, zigzagging across the top of the roof, using water from the, 1940, from the 1840 cistern on the island, which is still functional today. And on this photograph, which is the only one that I could, could, could locate, Goodhart's restaurant, the roof is located on the lower left-hand corner of the photograph. You'll notice the swimming pool. And then behind it is the catchment, which was built in 1840, which was part of the Royal Mail Steam Packet Company. And below that is the cistern, which still holds water today. 
At the time the Goodharts purchased the, the, um, the restaurant, the Goodhart family had no experience running a restaurant. The Goodharts converted the house into a bar with a restaurant with a few rooms to rent out. Nancy Good, uh, uh, Mr. Goodhart hired a five-star chef named Hubert Granier, who was once the chef at the esteemed Georges Saint Hotel in Paris. Hubert was somehow working on Martinique when he was hired by Mr. Goodhart. Nancy remembers Hubert running the kitchen with an iron hand, especially when Hubert chased Nancy and her friends through the kitchen with a meat cleaver when they would sneak into the kitchen to steal baked Alaska desserts. The restaurant had no set menu. Each night's fare was dependent upon the provisions which were brought in by freighter and deposited on the Waiko dock. Each evening, Hubert would present a full six course meal and on Sundays, a sumptuous brunch. Nancy remembers the restaurant always being packed. At age seven, she would take dinner reservations from the people all over the world. One such guest was Lord and Lady Glendon when Lord Glendon was a member of the House of Lords in England. Nancy recalled the family dealing with dead goats in the cistern, issues obtaining fresh water from the passing water barge, um, the cistern being low, uh, dealing with faulty water pumps and other tribulations uh, of, of island life, all chronicled in Don't Stop the Carnival. If you look at this photograph, you'll see in the upper left-hand corner, the water barge, and in the upper right-hand corner, Hassel Island. The Goodharts had their piano shipped from Colorado to the restaurant and located it in the bar area. Nancy remembers Victor Borgia playing, playing piano accompanied by a famous opera singer, Miss Maria Callas. A frequent bar visitor was Herman Woke, sitting at the bar, not drinking, but taking notes on the goings and comings of the people in the restaurant and drinking at the bar. It was noted that Woke would not drink, just take notes to the frustration of Harry Sr. The Good Arts had a swimming pool constructed and filled with salt water. As a prank, young Harry would put baby sharks in the pool water to scare the guests. And this was told to me by Nancy. Of course, it was denied by her brother. Nancy stated she had spent many hours roaming over Hassel Island, exploring the ruins and sleeping under the stars at Prince Frederick's Battery. In the intro, I mentioned, quote, where the smoking gun battles between sailing ships and the old stone fort went with the flag changes. There was a gun battle fought on Hassel Island, Prince Frederick's Battery between the HMS Arab, a British man of war, and the fort on March 3rd, 1801. Nancy had a pet donkey with long eyelashes that she named Maybelline, who had an affinity to eat unlit cigarettes. Young Harry remembers he and his sister boarding US Navy ships and watching movies on the fantail with the crew, playing cards with the sailors on US Navy subtenders and swimming and diving with the US Navy divers from the UDT, that is underwater demolition teams, quote the frogmen who are the precursor of today's elite US Navy SEALs. These sealed, these UDT detachments were stationed on subbase St. Thomas which is another Don't Stop the Carnival storyline. Harry recalls having the dinghy out from the restaurant to deliver a case of a specifically requested named brand of cognac to the yacht of Aristotle Onassis, anchored in St. Thomas Harbor for Mr. Onassis' special guest, Sir Winston Churchill. Harry remembers a cast of famous people renting one of the rooms at the restaurant. And these were rooms to rent, not cottages as depicted in Don't Stop the Carnival. Actor Hugh O'Brien would go diving and spearfishing. Actor Hal Holbrook stayed during the recess from his one man play, Mark Twain. And Mr. Victor Borgia, the famed comedic pianist and native Dane, um, Harry remembers as being quote, naturally charming. Both Harry and Nancy attended the Antilles School, and Harry was a childhood friend of Herman Wolk's son, Nate, who also attended the school. The restaurant boatman would take both children daily from Hassel Island to King's Wharf, where they were to wait their ride from the Grand Hotel to the Antilles School. Upon the school day end, 
they would return to the Grand Hotel where Nancy had a tab at the bar to purchase sodas and snacks while she awaited the boatman to take them back to Hassel Island. The Goodhart sold the property in 1964 to a man from Pennsylvania who, according to Nancy, quote, did not adjust well to island life. That owner opened the Royal Mail Inn in 1965. The Goodhart family remained on, Hassel, remained on island, living in a state poor until 1979, 80, when they returned to the mainland. Harry Goodhart Sr. was a founding member of the St. Thomas Yacht Club, along with John Battles, John Knight, Alto Walter, and John Foster. Another possibility for the Gulf Reef Club and Don't Stop the Carnival was St. Croix by the Sea, located on Protestant Key in St. Croix. Some say the Gulf Reef Club and Don't Stop the Carnival it was based up upon St. Croix by the Sea. This was told to me by Miss Tawny Weber Christman. Miss Christman uh, is the daughter of James and Barbara Weber, who owned St. Croix by the Sea Hotel on Protestant Key. The Webbers, James and Barbara, were originally from Hillsdale, Illinois. When the Webbers came to the islands um, in the early 1950s, when Mr. Weber was employed at the Condito Beach Hotel in Puerto Rico. They had heard about a quaint resort on, on St. Croix owned by a Mr. Eric Lawetz. Mr. Lawetz had built some small cottages and dug a saltwater pool on Protestant Key on St. Croix, and he called it St. Croix by the Sea. The novel's description of the decorations and the decor of the, hell, of the hotel bar and cottages are like those described in Don't Stop the Carnival. Quote, the bar decor was fishnets, small sea fans, painted white, gone a little gray, green glass bubble neck floats, dusty conch shells and bleached coral. One solid wall was painted with amateurish pictures of fish, unquote. Another quote, quote, the white stucco cottage was on the other side of the lawn, which was clear across the narrow part of the island. The interior of the cottage smelled of mildew and insecticide. There were four large beds covered in red novel cotton. The rough right walls were splashed here and there with framed watercolors of palms, flowers, and fish, unquote. The Webbers purchased the property in 1953 and planned a grand reopening. 24 hours prior, prior to the grand reopening, the water pump that supplied water to the cisterns failed. The guests were unhappy and about to move out. And after many hours of frustration of not getting the water to flow, Mr. Weber hired, quote, a local who was able to jury rig the system to pump water, a la Hippolyte La Martine and Don't Stop the Carnival. Ms. Weber also confirmed that the Don't Stop the Carnival storyline of the main cistern cracking at the Gulf Reef Club did happen to the cistern at St. Croix by the Sea after a stiff earthquake. The scenes in the novel depicting the boatmen rowing guests a short distance from the seaside boardwalk to and from the club could fit the distance between Christian said boardwalk and the short rowing distance to the hotel on Protestant Key. Ms. Crispin also commented that the slower paced lifestyle described in the novel was more representative of St. Croix at that time by the faster paced lifestyle on St. Thomas. Ms. Crispin could not recall seeing Herman Wolk there when she was there before she and her mother moved to St. Thomas after her parents separated in 1961. It is quite possible that Woke visited the resort after that time, although I could find no record to confirm that. Another possible storyline came from John Foster and the Galleon House. John Foster, longtime owner of the Galleon House, still resides here on St. Thomas. He arrived here in 1961 as a crew member aboard a 70 foot catch from Southampton, England. In my interview with Mr. Foster, he spoke of his first living situation as a house sitter for the owners of the Galleon House, guest house on Government Hill, near where Herman Woke had rented a residence. Woke would frequent the guest house bar where he and Foster would be, became friends. 
On one such occasion, Mr. Foster recalled, Woke was sitting at a table at the guest house writing. John approached Herman and asked what he was writing. And Herman stated that, quote, he was writing about good hearts on Hassel Island. And, quote, I might even write about you. In 1964, John Foster purchased the Galleon House and a convoluted business arrangement from a local bank, which was perfectly described in Don't Stop the Carnival when Norman Paperman purchases the Gulf Free Club. Mr. Foster also stated that Mr. Woke would frequent the Grand Boco Inn on Subbase where the Navy personnel would spend their drinking time and the Water Island Hotel on Water Island. Mr. Foster also spoke of a select group of folks who would congregate on the second floor of the Grand Hotel around, quote, the round table, unquote, at which only the hill crowd could sit. These were the old moneyed inhabitants. This is mentioned in Don't Stop the Carnival, Chapter 2, where Woke refers to Signal Mountain as Government Hill. Quote, Signal Mountain. The people here are known as the hill crowd shop owners, the old plantation families, retired rich folk, retired military, assorted drunks living on trust fund, mostly white, but there are some leading old families there also. Another possible storyline for Don't Stop the Carnival comes from the Carib Beach Hotel. Bill Dowling was the owner of the Carib Beach Hotel. He also owned Cardo's jewelry stores. Mr. Dowling passed away in 2003. I learned these details about Mr. Dowling from his obituary. In 1952, Bill Dowling's parents visited St. Thomas on a cruise and decided to invest in some property. Young Bill became curious about the island and came down on a visit and stayed. He purchased what was then the Caribbean Beach Hotel, a structure built in 1940 as an adjunct to the Naval Hospital. It had been closed for many years when Bill purchased it. He renovated the building into a 36 room hotel and renamed it the Carib Beach Hotel and opened it in 1955. It was the first hotel to offer steel pan music and limbo dancing as depicted in Don't Stop the Car Carnival and became quote, the place to party for visitors and residents alike. Early guests included Liberace, who arrived unannounced and stayed three weeks, quote, charming the guests and staff. To accommodate the overflow of guests, the hotel staff would string up sheets to set up extra bedrooms in what was once the Naval Hospital's main ward. Royalty and military heroes from Europe and throughout the world stayed, quote, between the sheets of the hospital ward. The Carib Beach Hotel was also the staging area for taxis picking up passengers from the airport as depicted and described in Don't Stop the Carnival. Bill Dowling recalled Herman Woke had a daily routine of having his evening meal at the Carib Beach Hotel. He would quiz Bill about the events of the day, what was going on at the hotel, the stories of the guests, and so on. Upon reading Don't Stop the Carnival, Bill Dowling was quoted as saying, quote, Woke got a lot of that script from me, unquote. Another possibility was the Water Island Hotel on Water Island. In early 1951, William and Floride Phillips heard about Water Island from Isidore Piwanski. After an island inspection, the Phillipses and their partners, uh, Raymond and Edward Bills, formed the Water Island Incorporated and proceeded to lease the island from the St. Thomas Development Authority. The Phillipses then then proceeded to renovate the existing army barracks on the island into a 50 room resort hotel. The Water Island Hotel opened on December 22nd in 1953 and operated as such until 1965. From 1965 to 1977, it was reopened as the Water Isle Hotel and operated under various names until 1989 when it was destroyed by Hurricane Hugo. Again, Herman Woke was known to frequent the bar there. It was said that when William Phyllis was once asked about his interactions with Herman Woke, Bill was heard to say, you mean that old SOB? He never ordered a drink, unquote. Water Island lies directly across the channel from Subbase, which, which is now Crown Bay. Woke would have had to take a water taxi from Crown Bay 
to Water Island, a distance too far to row. The U.S. Navy submarine base was located in Crown Bay, St. Thomas. And if you look at this photograph of sub base, you'll see the four submarine docks in Crown Bay where the cruise ships pull in now. But behind it, you'll notice the stone catchment, which is, is still there. Um, it was called sub base. Sub base was also the home training base for the UDT frogmen, the forerunners of today's US Navy SEALs. The UDT units would come from the mainland and deploy to sub base St. Thomas from January to April each year for training and recertification. In this photograph, I want you to note the, um, in the left-hand corner, these, uh, the water catchment. And just in front of the water catchment, you'll see a gentleman in a white Panama hat and a suit. I tried to blow that up. Um, maybe it was Herman Wolk, but could not determine it. The UDT personnel, when they were deployed to St. Thomas, would be quartered in Quonset huts and old Navy barracks buildings. One of those old Navy barracks buildings and subbase was transformed into what was called the Grand Boco Inn. The Grand Boco Inn was a frequent hangout for the UDT detachments undergoing training and was known to be frequented by Woke, as confirmed by John Foster, which would explain Woke's knowledge of the UDT uh, comings and goings as described in Don't Stop the Carnival. So in summary, Don't Stop the Carnival, facts. Herman Woke resided on St. Thomas from 1958 to 1964. Don't Stop the Carnival was published in 1965. Woke was known to frequent the bars and dine in the restaurants of Good Hearts on Hassel Island, Galleon House, as it's attested to by eyewitness John Foster, and frequented the Carib Beach Hotel, conversing with Bill Dowling, the owner, over dinners, discussing the comings and goings of island life and the guests, and frequented the Water Island Hotel on Water Island and the Grand Boco Inn in Subbase. The Goodhart family owned the property on Hassel Island from 1956 to 1964. Woke was known to frequent the bar at Goodhart's, taking notes and observing the goings on. Woke was quoted by John Foster as saying that, quote, he was writing about Goodhart's restaurant on Hassel Island. The Goodhart sold the property in 1964, the same year that Woke left the island and a year before Don't Stop the Carnival was published. The new owner of, Go of Goodhart's opened the Royal Mail Inn, which operated from 1965 to 1971. Based upon the dates and time frame, the Royal Mail Inn was not operating at the time Woke was on island and opened after Woke had departed the island. The description of the bar decor at the Gulf Reef Club and Don't Stop the Carnival is like the description of St. Croix by, by the sea although we can neither confirm nor deny that Woke visited that establishment. Opinions. The novel's descriptive landscapes are, are indicative of all of our islands. The description of the boardwalk and the physical description of the Gulf Reef Club bar lobby and rooms as described in Don't Stop the Carnival mirror that of St. Croix by the sea. The physical proximity of the boardwalk on Christianstead to Protestant Key, the location on, of, of St. Croix by the sea, approximates, approximates the short rowing distance between the waterfront of the Ro Re uh, Reef Bay Club as described in Don't Stop the Carnival. That same distance between St. Thomas Waterfront and Hassel Island and the distance between Crown Bay to Water Island would be too far to row. The taxi stands described in Don't Stop the Carnival were descriptive of the taxi stands at the Carib Beach Hotel on St. Thomas. The stories of water cistern issues, plumbing and pump problems, cistern collapses, labor problems, etc., were all stories garnered from several of the establishments Bulk was known to, to frequent. The novel's description of the island transfer to U.S. jurisdiction, to US jurisdiction during World War II loosely describes the transfer of the islands to the United States, March 31st, 1917, during World War I. 
The military actions of the old stone fort refer to the gun battle between Prince Frederick's battery on Hassel Island and the British warship, the HMS Arab, which did occur on March 3rd, 1801. The United States Navy submarine base and the UDT units described in Don't Stop the Carnival were located on St. Thomas. The scenes in Don't Stop the Carnival depicting Carnival and the description of our island's slower paced lifestyle describes both St. Croix and St. Thomas yet favors St. Croix during the time period of the novel. Conclusions. Based upon the collection of true stories garnered from the people I've interviewed, with the collections of with the recollections of Homer and Wolk, Wolk being on island, and the tales told from each of the hotels and bars, and the fact that the Royal Mailian was not in operation when Wolk was on island, I believe that the novel Don't Stop the Carnival was not based on the Royal Mail Inn, but rather the Gulf Reef Club in the novel is best depicted by St. Croix by the Sea, Protestant K, St. Croix. The storyline of Don't Stop the Carnival is an amalgamation of the stories from the places, the bars, the hotels, the restaurant that Woke frequented and the stories he heard while he was at, those pla at these places, his own experiences of living on St. Thomas and his knowledge and, ex and experiences living in the New York world of, of a press agent, a la Norman Paperman. I don't think we will ever know for sure what Herman Wolk had in mind. His forward in the book gives some tongue in cheek reference to his time here on St. Thomas. But when you get right down to it, it doesn't really matter because it's a novel. But like most novels, it's based upon some factual information. One of the lines in the novel which strikes me the most, which I think we need to take away is this. We live in a place where today is like yesterday and tomorrow is like today. That existence is a wheel of recurring patterns with, from which no one escapes. That all anybody does in this life is live for a while and then die for good without finding out much. And that therefore the idea is to take things easy and enjoy the passing of time under the sun. Before we open up for discussions and questions about Don't Stop the Carnival, I would like to relate another short tale of an author who spent time here on St. Thomas that I discovered while doing my research on Don't Stop the Carnival. Another author's story. Bonnie and Roland Spell came to St. Thomas in October of 1988 from Boston, Massachusetts. They'd been on island for over 30 years. They opened up their eatery on waterfront and named it Bumpus, named after Bonnie's grandfather, whom she called Bumpa. In 1961, or excuse me, in 1991, a man walks into Bumpa's restaurant and orders coffee, proceeds to a table and enjoys his coffee as he overlooks the Charlotte Amalie waterfront. As the restaurant starts to fill with the lunch crowd, the man gets up and leaves. He returns the next day, orders coffee again and sits Enjoying the view. In conversation with Bonnie and Roland, Roland asks the man what he does for a living. And the man says he's a writer, staying at Hotel 1829. He asks if he could sit every day and enjoy his coffee and just watch the people go by on the waterfront. Roland says, well, you know, buddy, I got three kids I got to put in college. I'm running a restaurant. When it starts to get busy, you got to order something or you have to leave. And the gentleman says, fine, no problem. The man comes in every day for about three months, excuse me, two months. After a period of two months, he says goodbye to Bonnie and Roland. Roland asks him, he says, what are you writing? And the gentleman says, you'll know when it's published. The novel published in 1992 was The Pelican Brief, written by the author, John Grisham. The premise of The Pelican Brief is, two Supreme Court justices have been assassinated in a law, in a, and a law student stumbles upon the truth. An investigative reporter wants the story, yet everyone else wants the law student dead. That's the premise of the novel. 
John Grisham was born January, February 8th, 1965 in Jonesboro, Arkansas. He attended the University of Ole Miss. He has written the novels of The Firm, A Time to Kill, uh, his first novel, uh, The Client, The Rainmaker, and The Chamber. In the movie and in the novel, there's a scene that takes place in a restaurant in Washington, D.C. called Ben's Chili Bowl. It's an actual restaurant that is still there. And this depicts the encounter between John Grisham and Roland Spell. The character, Larry Grantham, played by Denzel Washington as a reporter for a newspaper. He's sitting in Ben's Chili Bowl waiting for his White House contact. He's sitting at the counter, taking up space, drinking coffee. The owner comes over to Gary Grantham character and tells him, hey, buddy, I got three kids I got to put into college. You got to order something or you have to leave. This is an exact replica of what conversation took place between John Grisham and Roland Spell. In the end of the novel, our heroine, Darby Gray, vacations on a Caribbean island. In the last chapter of the Pelican Brief, Grisham writes, I quote, a dozen cruise ships of all sizes sat perfectly still in the shimmering water. They stretched in a careless formation almost to the horizon. In the foreground near the pier, 100 sailboats dotted the harbor and seemed to keep the bulky tour ships at bay. The water under the sailboats was clear, soft blue, and as smooth as glass. It was gently, it gently curled around Hassel Island and it grew darker until it was indigo and then violet as it touched the horizon. A few soft, perfect rows of cumulus clouds marked the line where the water and the sky met." Unquote. John Grisham, The Pelican Brief. Before we open up to questions and discussion, I need to recognize a few people um, whose assistance uh, really helped make this presentation possible. I'd like to, like to thank Ms. Nancy Goodhart Matthews and her brother, Harry Goodhart, for sharing their photographs and childhood memories and stories of Hassel Island. I'd like to thank Ms. Tawny Weber Chrisman for her recollections and photographs of St. Croix by the sea. I'd like to thank Mr. John Foster for his stories of the Galleon House and the leads to the Water Island Hotel and the Grand Boco Inn. I'd like, to, I'd like to thank my good friends, Bonnie and Roland Spell for their tale of the Pelican Brief. I'd like to thank Ms. Pamela Montague our trust chairperson for her encouragement and patience. I'd like to thank Ms. Kevin Qualls, another tr trust board member and the technical wizard behind this presentation for keeping this all abacus brain of mine adapted to the 21st century virtual Zoom world. I'd like to thank my Trello, my fellow trust member, and my good friend, my Hassel Island mentor, Mr. Charles Consalvo for challenging me to always do better. But most noteworthy, I would like to challenge Mr. I'd like to thank Mr. Paul Gillen, whose email challenged the trust to further explore the modern history of Hassel Island and started me down this rabbit hole. However, in this modern era of full disclosure and transparency, it is my duty to say that Mr. Paul Gillen is indeed the significant other of Miss Nancy Goodhart Matthews. This has been a fun project for me. I'm glad Mr. Gillen and Mr. Gonsalvo started me on this journey, but whatever one takes away from this discussion on Don't Stop the Carnival, I believe it is well worth the read. I recommend it. And if it's been a while since you've read it, it is a good reread, hopefully reading it from a different perspective. I thank you for your attention and I open it up for questions and discussions. Uh, and everyone can unmute their microphone when they want to ask a question. And uh, thank you, Doc. That was fantastic. I appreciate it. Thank you. Anybody want to have anybody have a discussion? Any one of the questions? Yes. Sir. I, I, I would like to just say that, number one, this is just gorgeous and exciting and fantastic. And I would like to recognize my partner in crime, John Foster, and I would like to recognize the St. Thomas Garden Club for Men
for all they have done <laughs> in this dubious history that we have so far uncovered. Thank you very much. Woo! <laughs> Thank you for your thank you for your comments, Mr. Ogden. You should point out that Harry Goodhart was a member of the Garden Club. I'm I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear that. You should you should know that Harry Harry Goodhart was a member of the Garden Club. Um, I didn't hear. I'm sorry, you were garbled. I didn't hear the last part. Something must be wrong with my mic. I'm sorry. I said that. Harry Goodhart was a member of the St. Thomas Garden Club. Ah, that I did not know. Thank you for that piece of information. Anyone else? Doc, Nancy and I want to thank you for your presentation and uh, it uh, really something very special for us. Okay. Is, that, is that you, Paul? That would be me. <laughs> well, thank you for starting me down this journey. Yeah. Um, just a quick question, John Foster here. John, how are you? Hello. Yes. Yep. Hello. Hello. Um, the, uh, the one of one of the factors I think uh, that should be brought out is that Herman had um, a uh, young rabbi uh, teacher for his children on when he was on Government Hill uh, <laughs> when he lived there, and when he the young man would come to Galleon House after a, a very hectic day of teaching of the young children. And he would rush up to the bar at Galleon House and say, I need a drink. I need a drink. I've had a terribly bad day with those children. And I would say, well, don't worry about it. Because the novel that he takes notes on my test is going to be a great success. And you'll be a part of it somehow. <laughs> the the rabbi's name was uh, Rabbi Tatnik, um, and uh, he also taught at Antilles. Okay, was that? Now, I'm, was I, I'm Jenny Smith. I'm Ira Smith's daughter. Ah, okay. Ple ple pleasure, pleasure to meet you. And in all, um, in all honesty and transparency, um, the phone call I received from your husband today led me down the rabbit hole to Smith's Fancy and research right. your father. He was quite an artist, right? And you had the um, the um, art gallery at uh, of Smith's Fancy. That's right. And it was a get, it was a guest house that they started in 1948. Okay. Uh, continued on to 62. Um, and it's, we it is still in the family today. It's now apartments on, located right above the synagogue. Okay, yes, I know where it is. And, but, and thank you, Tom, for calling me today and, and giving me that information. It just, it just, it, it, it because when I read the, um, the forward of his 1987 edition, of Don't Stop the Carnival, he mentions that um, that he'd been on the island prior to his time living here. Um, I couldn't find in anything in my research that said when he actually was, but when you made that phone call today, you filled in that missing piece. So I thank you very much for that. Yes, and, and also too, that so he, he stayed on the island prior to that and the that's how Marjorie Morningstar, his prior novel, had the name of Morningstar. It was named after Morningstar Beach. It was supposed to be Morgan Stern. Oh, okay. <laughs> and it got love, changed to Morningstar. I love all these little bits of, of tidbits of information that, that, that come through once people start making the recollections and the, and the connections. And that to me is the important part of history. It's not, it's not, the, it's not the factual, uh, the historical factual part, it's the stories that go along with it to me. Anyone else? I wanna just compliment you on the amount of research you did and ask you how long it took you to do all this. Um, <laughs> well, Judy, to tell you the truth, um, as soon as uh, that email came in on uh, October 20th, 
um, I was on the, uh, Charles Consalvo uh, was on the phone and we got to, to talking and I was in Pennsylvania at the time. And uh, to be quite honest with you, it actually started on the 21st of October. And, oh, wow. uh, and, and it ended today with the last piece of information I got from Tom Bolt about uh, Woke's time on St. Thomas in 1948. So, oh, and, and to be quite honest with you, I'm still going to be researching because I want to find out who bought the property from the Goodharts in 64 and started the Royal Mail Inn. Mm -hmm. so that's, another, that's another piece of this puzzle. So. Hey, Doc, Nancy Matthews, Nancy Goodhart here. I hey, wanted to say you? hi to Jenny, too. <laughs> hi, sweetie. It's great to see you. Doc, thank you for doing such a beautiful job. That was really an honor to hear this tonight. And it's been fun well, getting to know you. Um, I, I really appreciate um, you, you sharing um, all of your family stories. Um, some, some of which is in this. Um, a couple of things about Nancy. Um, she didn't want me to mention this, but I'm gonna mention it anyway. Uh, not only did Nancy take reservations at age seven, but she also worked behind the bar. <laughs> and, and, um, <laughs> um, and it was like, we learned how to make Poos Cafes, Poos Cafes <laughs> with Bowles liqueur, all those different layers. <laughs> I was very proud of the fact that I could make a Poos Cafe. Yes. And then it was my second or third phone call with Nancy and in conversation, I asked her if she, if she knew Mr. Paul Gillen who started this and Nancy goes, oh yeah, he's my boyfriend, <laughs> which was okay. Put the pieces together, it's pretty interesting. So thank you, Nancy, for, for sharing stuff. I really appreciate it. Doc. I would Doc, want also it, mention that the, the, uh, the story about uh, the, the prior owners, the Johnson, and they did have, um, they did, she did have a lion cub. At, when I was about 10 years old, I had uh, long hair and braids and remember being seated um, on their living room, having gone over there with my parents and felt a, a slight tug on the back of my braid and turned around to find a lion cub chewing on the end of my braid. Well, see, I'm, <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm, glad, you, I'm glad you confirmed that story because now I have two primary sources, you and Nancy. So thank you for that. <laughs> and My and question is, is, what happened to, I, to the lion after he grew up? Mr. Bar. Uh, we want to Mary Mary Gleason and I want to know what happened with the lions. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like I'd like to know too. <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, Pam, Pam, could you they can't hear me, right? Uh, no, they can hear you, Mary. Oh, okay, great. Can everybody hear Mary Gleason? No. Barely. Um, hang on, Mary. I'm gonna, I'm gonna um Okay. I'll turn you. I'll turn you around. Now they can hear and see you. I think. Oh. Oh. Okay. Great. This. This is just awesome. I couldn't manage to get in on my own, but Pam very graciously got me in. In any event, uh, I see that we have uh, Andrew Bonnie is in the audience, and Andrew is the grandson of George Elm, uh, who purchased the house on uh, Skyline from Herman Woke. And uh, I, I wish Andrew, I think Andrew is there, if he'd say a word or two. Hi, Mary. Uh, it's great to see you uh, through this format. Yes, my name's Andrew Bonney. Um, I work for Cape Air, the airline here, oh. and uh, normally live up in Massachusetts and had the fondest memories of visiting my grandfather um, at that house on Skyline when I was very little. And with the pandemic um, and our children being able to be remote and my wife's job was remote and I'm able to do my Cape Air job down here in St. Thomas, uh, was able to do something we've talked about for years and years, which is come back to St. Thomas. And so we're, I'm here for the winter and who knows how much longer. Um, and it's just really great to be back here. Um, Mr. Palencia, I was 
amazed to see those pictures that you very briefly showed of the house. Um, I was pretty little uh, when we were there. So I'll follow up with you afterward. I'd love to get a copy of those pictures. And I'm and I, obviously I, interested I'll, to know I'll, what the status of the house is today. Um, but so uh, Mary, actually, thanks so much for uh, the shout out. Yeah, um, actually those those pictures are quite recent. So yeah, that the house is still in, in, in a state of disrepair, unfortunately. But I've been told that the downstairs is habitable. So I don't know. So I have two, two cents to put in about the house. Um, when he built the house, um, my best friend, Jane Wales, her father, who had a company called Wales Roads, did the bulldozing. And one of the unique things about the house is one of the cisterns is above ground, as I recall, so that it would be gravity fed um, during the Sabbath. And so that uh, during the Sabbath, um, they would not uh, use um, the cistern or the pumps to, to for them to be able to get water. In addition, um, the people that work for them had to be Seventh-day Adventists so that they would um, be uh, have a similar Sabbath in their, uh, through their own religion. And those are two of the things that I remember as a child, uh, as stories I heard about the house there when they built it. Those, you know, that explains. Those are interesting facts. I knew, I knew that, that uh, Mr. Woke was an Orthodox Jew, okay? But I didn't, I didn't realize that he actually um, practiced it to that effect that he, um, um, altered the design of his house so he would not have to use electricity. That would also explain why he didn't go to Mars. I'm sorry? It would explain why he didn't drink it would explain why he didn't go to Mars. He didn't get to Mars. Okay, yeah, that's and that's uh, another uh, little tidbit that that fills in. So thank you with that. Uh, Anyone else? Yes. Hey, uh, hi. Yeah. <laughs> oh, um, I I have no idea if this is a true story or not, but I heard that um, Herman Woke yeah. left the island uh, when the uh, synagogue decided to install an organ, and he felt that was totally inappropriate. <laughs> and totally and I don't know if there's yes, any yes. truth to that. Huh. And I don't know if, if there's any way that I could verify that story. Well, you find, find out what the organ was put in. That, that yeah, would make Robert Kriegel very unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I got to the synagogue in 1973, it was a piano. It was not an organ, so. Absolutely. <laughs> yep. <laughs> well done, Donald. So, so what you're saying, Mr. Pomerantz, is that in 1973, there was a piano there and not an organ. I, I would be surprised if there was ever an organ, but he would object to even having a piano. Yeah, that would do okay. it. Okay. Well, another fact I did not know. Thank you for putting that in. I, I think it was, I think the reason was because Donnie Pomerantz uh, was part of the choir uh there at the uh, <laughs> and I, I, I think that may have been the reason that he felt compelled to leave mm -hmm. yeah uh, by the way i by the way i used to... unmute john unmute take your mute off to... hey good yep yeah. i i had to manage the house and explain to him many times that um we had problems with the cistern with the pump. He was in Washington and I have several letters from him coming back and forwards about why he had to spend money on plumbers, et cetera. And those are treasured letters that I still have. <laughs> wow, that's great. That's great. Anyone else have a memory or a story or something else that they'd like to share or a question? If not, I'll close. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Um, I was a little nervous doing this presentation. I've never done a Zoom presentation before. I uh, wasn't sure how it's going to work out, um, but I think everyone had a good time, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you.
Thank you. It was great. Thank you. Thank you. Have it a, was great. Have, have a good night, everyone. Thank you, Doc. You night, too. Night. It was Thank great. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Good job. <laughs> you didn't seem nervous at all. You would look like a professional. Hello, Lisa. How are you, sweetie? I'm okay. How are you? You look great. Thanks. Well, Zoom off my computer offers a wonderful filter for my Zoom meetings and when I teach. I, I like your background. How, how's the boys? They're good. They're really good. Um, they loved today because it was 63 degrees and they were outside in shorts and t-shirts acting like it was a summer's day. So it was wonderful. Everyone, this is my daughter, Lisa Wheatley. Hi. And she's and she called in from Laurel, Maryland tonight. That's right. Yes. So <laughs> very good. So, thank well, you. good job. You did a great job. Well, thank you, Lisa. You're I'll call you during the week. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> good night, everybody. Signing off. Mr. Palencia, if I could just real quick, yes. um, I'd love to be able yes. to follow up with you to find out more about the current disposition of the house. Sure. Um, um, why don't you, um, let me give you my phone number. Okay. Sure. You ready yep. to copy? Yes, sir. 340? Yep. 2444? 244, 254, 256? 3, 3, 340, 244, 254, 256. Yes. Are, are you by any chance scheduled for a downtown walking tour tomorrow? Yes, sir. I'll see you then. I'm giving the tour. <laughs> Magnificent. I thought, I thought I recognized the name. So that's, oh, that's, that's great. That's I'll see you tomorrow. Great. Yeah, well, sounds great. Okay. I, I really look forward to it. it. You did, you did okay. just an amazing job tonight. Bravo. That Thank was you. absolutely Thank fascinating. you very much. Great work. I appreciate the feedback. Yeah, Thank you, you bet. Good night, everyone. Good night.